Good afternoon, everyone. And for some, it's good morning and others, it's good evening. It's a joy and privilege to welcome you all today for the American Scientific Affiliation fourth annual winter symposium. We're so delighted to have each and every one of you here from all over the globe and many different time zones. That's the beauty of our new normal of virtual meetings. And in fact, we have 15 different com countries represented in our Zoom house today. We also want to warmly greet our partner organizations, as well as several chapters, churches, Christian study centers, and college groups hosting watch parties all across North America. My name is Vicki Best, and I serve as the Executive Vice President for the ASA, and I'm joining you from Topsfield, Massachusetts, which is on the North Shore of Boston and the location of the ASA headquarters. As we navigate the complexities of our ever-changing world, Christians are looking for reliable information from fellow believers who understand science and are grounded in scripture. And in the midst of much hurting, yet with the hope of Christ, the ASA is delighted to bring you this timely event with Dr. Elaine Howard Eklund, titled Why Science and Faith Need Each Other in These Times. We are proud to call Elaine an ASA friend and partner over many years. And for those new to the American Scientific Affiliation, we are an international network of Christians in the natural and social sciences, as well as related fields. We were founded in 1941, and our mission is interpreting, integrating, and communicating the discoveries of science with the insights of scripture and Christian theology. As a scholarly and professional society of Christ followers, we aspire to excellence in scholarship, professional formation, and growing as a community that engages science and faith. We have 4,000 members and followers worldwide, and you can learn more about the ASA and membership at asa3.org. And as we spend the next hour and a half together, I know you are in for a meaningful time as Elaine brings her years of thoughtful research and reflection and makes the connection of our science and faith. Our sincere desire is that God will richly bless you by listening and learning how to better engage in your congregation and serve the church at large. Finally, I want to recognize the many people who made this event possible in addition to our sponsors and church partners, our loyal and dedicated team who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes, Becky, Dana, Mark, Lynn, Michelle, and Hannah, thank you all, as well as our terrific publicity team of ASA leaders from around North America who have helped promote the event to a wide audience. Now I'd like to turn this over to my colleague, Janelle Curry, who serves as the president of the ASA. Janelle will introduce our guest speaker and moderate the Q&A. Welcome, Janelle. Thank you, Vicki, and welcome, everybody. I'm pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Elaine Howard Eklund as our speaker today. Dr. Eklund is the Herbert S. Audrey Chair in the Social Sciences, Professor of Sociology, and Director of the Banya Institute for Religious Tolerance at Rice University. Elaine received her PhD from Cornell University, and I'm glad we have a Cornell group meeting today. And she is the leading scholar at the intersection of the topics of religion, science, and work. She's held numerous roles, including serving as the president of the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion and is presently the incoming president of the Religious Research Association. Elaine is particularly interested in how institutions change, and her social science research really challenges our assumptions about what we think we know. In this way, she brings a much needed, honest, nuanced, and ins insightful approach to her work that in turn serves the academy, society, and also the church. So I'm just pleased to be able to welcome Elaine with us today. 
Elaine? Thank you so much, Janelle. And um, thanks to my friends at the American Scientific Affiliation. Gosh, this is such an honor. And it's so fun um, in some ways to be on Zoom. And I can see the numbers rising of folks who are joining us. And I know um, there's some watch parties out there, including some uh, led by family members of mine. So just wanting to thank everyone for being here and hoping um, that what we'll do here today is really worthwhile and you'll going you'll go away having learned something and uh, being changed a bit from our time together. As a sociologist, for about the past 20 years, I have been interested in what scientists think about religion and matters of spirituality and faith and what religious people think about science. As part of my work, our team at Rice University um, in Houston, Texas, have surveyed nearly 40,000 scientists and completed over 1,000 in-depth interviews with them in their offices and laboratories and over Zoom and over phone and asked them what they think about faith and people of faith. I've also surveyed more than 30,000 members of the American public, including Christians, Jews, and Muslims in particular from various traditions, as well as those from many other traditions as well as those who have no religion at all in terms of what they think about science. Some of what I'm presenting today is um, based on my book with Brazos Press, Why Science and Faith Need Each Other, Eight Shared Values That Move Us Beyond Fear. I understand that some of you might've received a copy of the book when you registered. Um, and if you did, I hope you will read it and be in touch with me about um, your thoughts. And if I might be so bold that you might even leave a review on Amazon or somewhere else where you leave reviews. I also have been um, with our team at Rice University recently conducting a study about how people understand the relevance of faith and of science um, to the human body and really excited that some of that work also has made its way into these remarks. I wanna to talk today about three key insights and four shared values between science and faith that I think give us a real sense of hope um, in these times. And as we look around at the truly horrific things that are happening on the global stage, um, it's sometimes hard to have a sense of hope. And so it's always a real honor um, when we get a chance to talk about how, even in spite of everything that's going on, um, that we might have hope um, in these times. And I truly believe um, that we can. My first key insight is this. When it comes to science and faith, there is a fine line between fear and anger. Here's my story of fear. My daughter was three years old and I was picking her up from daycare. Uh, that day I was tired from work and parenting solo. She begged to stay a few more minutes to play with her friends and I acquiesced. She and her friends um, started playing a game of hide and seek. I turned away for just a minute. Um, to talk to some friends, um, some other parents. Daylight was starting to fade away, and I expected that at any moment she would slide up to me and wrap her arms around my leg and we would go home. After a few minutes, when that didn't happen, I started to look around. It's time to go, I called out, no response. One by one, the parents and children got into their cars and drove away. I called again. I then picked up my bag and walked over to where my daughter and her friends had been playing, but I did not see anyone. Where are you? Now my heart's starting to race, the physical manifestation of panic. Then I started to get really anxious and really afraid. I checked up and down the street and not caring what others would think, I actually started opening the doors of unlocked cars and looking inside, thinking maybe she was hiding in one. A man actually came out of his house and said, ma'am, are you trying to break into my car? With tears streaming down my face, I commissioned this stranger in the search. After 10 minutes, the director actually pulled me aside and said that 10 minutes was too long for a three-year-old to be missing, and she was going to activate the safety protocol 
which meant the police would be arriving in five minutes. Anyone who's cared for children identifies right now. In that moment, I truly believed that I might have lost her. And I felt a sense of fear like I've never felt before. And then she was suddenly standing right beside me. I picked her up and I squeezed her so tight that she actually asked me to lessen my grip. I also noticed a little boy that was standing next to her. He told us he'd actually heard her giggle and her breathing as he came near. The bottom line is this. The entire time I was searching, she had actually been hiding within 10 feet of me. She had heard me. She had heard the director of the daycare center. She'd heard my friend and the others helping in the search, all of us calling to her. And yet she chosen not to answer. Anyone who's ever cared for children who went missing identifies this as well. I felt an anger like I had never felt before. I let my daughter down softly onto the sidewalk and then I looked into her little face and I yelled, I'm so angry, I want to give you such a spanking. The director of the daycare, the one who'd called the safety protocol gently touched me and perhaps not wanting to witness what might happen next, said this, let's take a step back. There is a fine line between fear and anger. There is a fine line between fear and anger. I bring this lesson to my academic work on how religious people view science and scientists and how scientists view religion and religious people. Fear can masquerade as anger, leading to conflict. Fear can even rob us of hope. When we see conflict between religious and scientific communities, we need to take time to examine why there might be underlying fear and try to understand it. My second key insight is this. Sociologists bring something special and unique to understanding the fear or, or the intersection between faith and science. Sociologists bring something unique to understanding the intersection between faith and science. As a sociologist, I'm interested in group behaviors. I'm interested in how groups have an impact on individuals and how groups bring changes to society. One way we study this is by listening to people's life stories and analyzing to what extent these stories actually represent the groups individuals are part of. Sociological data also allows us to get past what we see so much in our current societies, the loud and combative voices. Sometimes the most loud and combative voices are the ones that drive public debate. And we can, if we use research, actually gain a more nuanced and accurate picture of what people think, value, and believe. Sociology doesn't have the same tools as philosophy or theology. It cannot tell us the right way to live. We need some other thought system to do that. But if we know how we want our communities or churches or labs to be different, then sociological data and research can help us understand group cultures and then engage in thoughtful practices that help us effect change. When it comes to examining the interface between science and religion, sociology provides a key insight. Science and religion are not just sets of ideas or thought systems, although they are indeed these things. Science and religion are also communities of people communities like laboratories and churches and universities and denominations. And some people, of course, are part of both communities. Here's another insight. Science and faith share core values, I'm going to argue, that could bring these communities together for the common good. Science and faith share core values that could bring these communities together for the common good. And the push in these past years to address the global pandemic medically and now to heal all of its collateral damage, damage that has had an inequitable impact on particular groups and communities. Healing that damage requires both 
faith and scientific communities working together at top capacity. I wanna turn now to discussing four values that can lead us beyond fear to collaboration. The first value is curiosity. Another quick story, you remember some conversations for the rest of your life. I interviewed Jill for my very first study of how scientists view religion. She was already at the top of her field, a biologist leading a successful laboratory in an elite research university, one of the only women at her institution at her level, and one of the less than 10% of women in her field of science at her level. As I walked toward her office, I noticed her door had a sign of the Darwin fish eating the Christian fish, the ichthu symbol. I was conducting my first study on scientists' attitudes towards faith, and as you know, the sign made me nervous. As I knocked tentatively, I actually started to think it would be okay if Jill had forgotten our appointment for our interview, but she came to the door right away. Jill did nothing to put me at ease. She did not greet me with a handshake or a smile. Instead, she curtly asked me to come in and directed me to sit on a metal chair across the desk from her. She told me she had nothing to say about science and faith. I can't remember now if the air conditioning in her office was on full blast or perhaps I just felt cold. My first question to Jill was if she practiced a religion or considered herself a religious person. She said, no, I'm simply an atheist. I then asked whether she'd been raised in a faith tradition. It was the type of question that could have been answered with a simple yes or no. You can imagine that I was taken aback when Jill looked away from me and her eyes began to fill with tears. In the years since then, I've interviewed nearly a thousand scientists about their views on faith, and Jill is one of the only ones who cried. As her tears welled up, my own feelings turned from apprehension to compassion. I also became curious about why the question about her faith background elicited such emotion. Jill told me she'd come from a Christian family and as a child, she spent a lot of time at church. Raised in a rural community, Jill also spent a lot of time outdoors, and she began to see the beauty in nature and to develop a real love of the natural world. She spent a lot of time on her schoolwork, too. She particularly loved her biology and chemistry classes. She told me she was a total geek and that her grades were fantabulous. But as she became more curious about the natural world, Jill also became concerned about aspects of her faith. She brought questions about the origin and development of life on earth and the role of God in creation to her parents and her pastors. At that point, Jill did not know she would go into science. She was simply an inquisitive kid, following and feeding her natural curiosity. But when I asked hard questions, I was told by my pastor, she told me, just to make a decision to believe, to forget about science. It was an answer that did not satisfy someone like Jill. She tried several times to talk with her youth group leaders about the questions science brought to mind, but her experiences with them were similar. She was consistently told not to explore so much. She said, I feel like religion was a mechanism by which judgment was passed on people who were different, she recounted. And for me, in my personal history, in my childhood, given how inquisitive I was, it was judgment and it didn't work out so well for me. By the time Jill was in her teens, she had left her church. How do we nurture a sense of curiosity in church communities and in scientific communities as an antidote to the kind of fear that robs hope. As a character trait, the philosopher Elias Baumgarten writes, curiosity is a disposition to want to know and learn more about a wide variety of things. The more one has this character trait, the more often or the more intensely one will on particular occasions experience a desire or urge to investigate and learn more about something. 
But in our current culture, the word curious seems small and even weak. It brings to mind a child wondering what is around the corner before she takes a look. Our culture seems to prefer stronger words like expert, leader, and winner. But we need to value more highly in our societies the ability to ask questions that help us better understand both others and ourselves and that help us lead better lives. Let's ask different questions. When you happen upon someone you disagree with, let curiosity replace anger and fear. Ask why. Curiosity, I want to argue, is actually a show of strength, a yearning to push the boundaries of knowledge. Scientists like Jill, and I'm sure like many of you, are known for their curiosity. For example, the string theorist Sylvester James Gates Jr., the first Black American to have an endowed chair in physics at a major research university and current president of the American Physical Society, says that he got used to being curious, to asking hard questions at an early age. I remember once I asked my dad, I said, Dad, do you remember me as a kid asking all kinds of questions? And dad said, yes. You always, I said, seem to have answers for everything. How did you do that? And he said, what you don't remember, son, is that if you didn't have it, if I didn't have an answer immediately, I would tell you to hold off. And then I would go and get some resource. And in the next day or so, I'd come back and try to engage you um, with your question again. Even though no one in Gates's family was a scientist, they created an environment that nurtured curiosity. And speaking specifically to the Christians who are listening, my research shows that many Christians are curious about the relationship between science and religion, science and faith, and how they can meaningfully integrate science with their faith. This curiosity can sometimes be painful and stressful. Christian communities can become safe places for the curious, especially those who are curious about science and faith. The most valuable resource in the Christian community is those who have personal experience and accomplishment, the fellow Christians who have successfully done it before them. For these Christians, from these Christians, we can learn more and better and newer ways of looking at the relationship between religion and science and why curiosity for science should be fostered and supported within the church. Churches, I think, need to become a place that offer the reward of nurturing and satisfying curiosity about science. Number two, the second shared value between scientific and faith communities I'm going to talk about today is humility, humility. I have been humbled. If you had asked me when I first started my research, whether there are many ways of being a religious scientist, I would have said, of course. I'm a good sociologist of religion. I know there are many, many ways of being a religious anything. If you had asked me if there are many different ways of being an atheist scientist, I probably would have said not really. Being an atheist of any sort is, by definition, not to believe in God. Simple as that. I was so sure I was right. But Also, as a sociologist, I have learned to doubt my assumptions, especially the assumptions I have about characteristics of groups. My studies of scientists over the past 15 years have shown me that there are indeed varieties of atheism in science. And so what did I do? I wrote a book called Varieties of Atheism in Science um, with Oxford University Press with my colleague David Johnson. This is just one of the ways that my research has really humbled and changed my previous thinking about a topic. Humility is recognizing the limitations of our own understanding, our own abilities and perspectives. From a Christian standpoint, humility is being aware in the simplest terms that we are not God. Christians also ought to be familiar with this idea, this theological idea of humility. We know that full truth can never be known 
because of our human limitations and our limited ability to know the mind of God. It's not there is no truth or that it doesn't matter to try to discern it. But as human beings, we don't yet see things clearly, as the pastor and theologian Eugene Peterson translates and paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. He says, we're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. On this earth, we are all so constrained by our limited human knowledge. Humility, especially intellectual humility, is also a key scientific virtue. In the study of scientific virtues conducted by philosopher Robert Pennock, he found that humility to evidence defined as the willingness to abandon a preferred hypothesis when faced with conflicting results was one of the 10 most widely held values of science as named by elite scientists. My studies have examined how scientists practice humility in their pursuit of understanding and truth. According to Lewis in his Mere Christianity, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. You cannot see God. A few years ago, I read an article by the scientist Amanda King. In it, she described some of the experiences that she had with her advisors and mentors as a graduate student. I think it shows us what the practice of humility can look, look like in science a little bit. King says, about two hours into a meeting about my research work, I realized that I was only the only person in the room who didn't have at least one PhD. Some had two. I don't know who these people are who have two, two PhDs. That's not a hypothetical comment. So why were they treating me with such unearned respect? King goes on to credit their humility. Humility, she says, does not mean meekness. Humility does not mean unconditional deference. Humility does not mean not standing up for what you believe in, including when you believe in your own scientific findings. Humility means being open to the possibility of being wrong being willing to consider other people's ideas and being respectful of your seniors, your peers, and your subordinates. From my own studies and experiences in science, I too have seen that intellectual humility and relational humility, embodying kindness and respect for the ideas of others, no matter their status, go hand in hand. When we recognize that we are limited in our own understanding, in our own abilities and perspectives, we are humble and kind about the limitations of others, and we have a deep sense that we can learn something from every person because of their common humanity. I've also noticed that practicing relational humility is not always easy for scientists, including myself. Science can be an extremely competitive environment that, as one scientist told me, often seems to chew up and spit out individuals with little regard for human dignity. Scientists work incredibly long hours with no guarantee of payoff. Often, we get so caught up in our career that we can forget the community of people that we are engaging with every day and who deserve to be treated with respect and who we have a responsibility for. We can also become too concerned with institutional status and prestige. Yet I've also found that many scientists place great importance on practicing relational humility in the workplace. Most of the about 20% of university scientists who are Christians I spoke with told me that caring for those they work with and mentor is extremely important to them. They also said it was important to ensure that those around them are being treated with care and respect. They often view their coworkers and students as people who are created in the image of God. One Christian biologist recounted how he tries, tries to use humility to shift the organizational culture of his work environment. He wants to make sure that there's a greater awareness that science is more than just a set of ideas and methods 
It's more than just a career. It's more than just a method. It's actually a community, he told me, a community of people that Jesus loves. Another scientist explained how her moral commitments as a Christian influence how she treats others. She said, regardless of their rank or background, as a Christian, I believe that people are equal and that everybody has the potential for good that makes them intrinsically valued, a very Christian belief. The third shared value is shalom. Shalom, the Hebrew word, comes from a root that means completeness and perfection. And it is the peace, harmony, well-being, and prosperity that results from the flourishing of all creation. In one sense, the journey towards shalom starts with each one of us. And I want to acknowledge that it is really hard to have that internal sense of shalom in these times of natural disaster, global poverty, global war, and the personal toll on our children and ourselves of just having been through a pandemic. I wrote the following about my struggle towards shalom in my journal. The pressures of being a researcher in the social sciences, which include applying for grants, teaching, mentoring, committee work, writing, and program management, alongside parenting, church work, and just the ordinary inundations of modern living make it really hard for me to get to a sense of peace or stillness. In the morning, I try to focus as I walk to work. Part of my prayer is a rendition of a phrase from Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. I repeat the phrase, Let me be still and know that you are God. As I walk to the university campus, I walk quickly as I pray. Let me be still. Thoughts of what I need to get done in the work hours ahead and what I left undone in the home hours behind immediately assault me. Let me be still. As I get nearer to the campus, I try to resist the urge to start listing the litany of things I need to do. Let me be still. As I wait for the light in front of the campus to turn green, I stand on one fit and then the other, trying to get in a few balance exercises that my physical therapist told me to do every day. I'm easily distracted. Let me be still. Once I'm on campus and through the beautiful entrance with its ornate architecture, my walk takes me through a building size art installation, which has a square in the top that's open to the sky. When I remember, I actually stop there and look through the square. It's here that I turn to the second part of my prayer. Let me know that I am fully loved by God. I pray this piece of the prayer because I often feel there are many, many people to impress as part of my work. Colleagues, students, funders, reviewers, to name just a few. And the culture of academic science is pressure-filled, highly competitive. I am at once preoccupied with my own limits and yet, in another sense, not yet aware enough of my own limits. Let me know that I am fully loved, that I have been created with everything I need in order to do what I need to do. The last part of my walk takes me up several flights of stairs. With each step, I repeat the third part of my prayer. Let me enter into what you are already doing today. When I arrive in my office at the earliest time before the sun fully rises, I'm excited to be there. I take joy in my work. I see it as having a higher purpose. I, On the not so good days, I fall prey to the hustle. I often consider skipping the walk so I can get work faster in the car. On the better days, I remind myself that I'm participating in what God is already doing there. I do not solely work for myself. My duty is beyond the self. I work for the academics I collaborate with and who read my work. I work for the students I mentor and teach. I work for the public outside the university for whom I try to explain my research in a way that helps them better understand the world. I work for my funders who have their own goals and missions. I work from the place of community-based virtues like equality and justice. I feel a responsibility to use my social scientific work 
to accomplish something meaningful, to improve social problems, and to help people flourish. Shalom, I would argue, always needs to move outside the self. It might start with our individual awareness, but then it needs to move out of us to flow through us to the communities we're part of. In my interviews with scientists who are Christians and the, with those of other faith traditions as well, I found that many of them feel similarly about their work and their goals, sometimes drawing on the concept of shalom and the twin concept of stewardship. Shalom cannot be pretended. In its best sense, it sometimes means getting involved with the messiness of the world and of the broader world, trying to mix it up with structures that are not just and to make them more so. The theologian Walter Brueggemann writes this in The Prophetic Imagination. Jesus, in his solidarity with the marginal ones, is moved to compassion. Compassion constitutes a radical form of criticism, for it announces that the hurt is to be taken seriously, that the hurt is not to be accepted as normal and natural, but is abnormal and unacceptable condition for humanists. From a specifically Christian standpoint, the compassion of Jesus is not to be understood as a personal, emotional reaction, but the compassion of Jesus is actually to be understood as a public criticism in which he dares to act upon his concern against the entire numbness of the social context. And from C.S. Lewis in The Problem of Pain, he writes, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscious consciences, but shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Several scientists who are Christians I interviewed explicitly discussed increasing the diversity of groups that feel comfortable in science as one of their goals and one of the ways they enter into shalom through their work as scientists. Some of these scientists specifically connect their faith to their efforts to increase opportunities for those who are underrepresented in science. Let me give you a little social science for a minute. When we look at the US scientific community, we see that non-whites, but especially black and Hispanic Americans and US born Asian Americans are vastly underrepresented in science. For example, Black Americans, who comprise about 13 to 15 percent of the U.S. population, depending where you live, make up just under 1 percent of all those who have careers in science, medicine, and technology. And women of all ethnic and racial groups are also underrepresented in much of science and medicine. While women represent more than 50 percent of the overall U.S. and U.K. population as well, they represent less than 10% of many science fields. And I've, I've studied both of these national contexts. And yet people of color and women are also overrepresented in churches. Nearly 77% of Hispanics, for example, see themselves as Catholics or evangelical Protestants. One reason Black and Hispanic Americans are underrepresented in science is that they're more likely to attend lower resource schools with poor science education. A related problem is that Christians from underrepresented minority groups often do not hear about scientists who believe like them or see scientists who look like them. So they face what I and other colleagues call a sort of double or even triple marginality as an underrepresented racial group, an underrepresented faith group, and an underrepresented gender group for some in the sciences. One Christian geneticist I met, one of the few Black women in her field in an elite university, was the first woman and the first Black American to become head of a genetics program. During five years she spent as a student, she said there was only one Black speaker brought in for her department's weekly seminar. For a lot of African Americans, science is a no trespassing zone, one Black pastor I interviewed said. He said, what I think it would do is it would be helpful to have somebody of your own skin color and your own faith in science. A Hispanic pastor said to see someone of your own faith, to see someone your own ethnicity would give you a sort of inspiration in science that nothing else would. 
Representation matters, and the lack of representation of women and underrepresented minorities in science is an issue that ought to concern the church as we try to usher shalom into the world. Science needs more diversity, and Christians, I think, have a responsibility as those who care about justice to be concerned about that lack of diversity and the injustices that cause it as part of our efforts to seek shalom. Those who have been and are most marginalized in our society often are deeply compelled to fight structures and engage in efforts that demarginalize others. The scientists, the science career can be used to care for people in the interest of justice, equality, and human flourishing, seeking shalom for the world and the people in it. The fourth value I want to talk about is healing. I hope you'll allow me to get personal here again. For most days for the past 30 years, I have experienced at least some pain in my hands, a result of joint degeneration I have from rheumatoid arthritis. In high school, there were times that I sat in my hands so others wouldn't notice that they looked different. My hands have called me, caused me physical and emotional suffering. I also know that my suffering, while significant to me, is really small um, compared with the suffering of so many others, and I want to acknowledge that. I believe that medicine and doctors have been utilized in my life to alleviate my suffering in effect to usher in the fourth value I'm talking about, to usher in healing. When my daughter was three, um, I had just started leading a big international research study. My orthopedic surgeon took a look at the cartilage in my hip joint. It, It had been completely worn away. Every step I took with my 38-year-old body racked me with pain. He said, you must be suffering. And as if there was any question about that, he said, I think I can get you in for surgery next week. You definitely need a hip replacement. How will I continue with my work, I thought. Four weeks later, I ambled slowly behind a walker, the kind you see being used by people in their 90-somethings in nursing homes, and into my classroom to teach. Eight weeks later, I sent my doctor a picture of me hiking. I have a deep gratitude and respect for what is aptly called the wonders of modern medicine. Without them, rheumatoid patients like me would not be able to walk. We do not generally think of suffering as a virtue. The main virtue related to suffering that the scientific and the faith communities share is the desire to alleviate it, the desire to heal physical pain. My research shows that many in faith communities across traditions, Jews, Muslims, Christians, and the scientific community have a strong desire to alleviate suffering and put profound importance on alleviating the suffering of others. For me, I am driven by two main philosophies, an atheist scientist said, know more today about the world than I knew yesterday, and along the way, lessen the suffering and bring healing to others. A Christian professor of biology I interviewed believes using his research to alleviate suffering is actually part of his calling as a scientist. Suffering is a great mystery, and human suffering is something that when it's in our power to alleviate as scientists, we should go ahead and do it. Another biologist who's a Christian told me he sees scientific research and technology as a way to intervene to provide relief from suffering. Christians often focus on lessening the suffering of others in order to bring God's peace to the world and to the human body. There's so much in the Bible to support this idea. A huge part of Jesus's ministry on earth was touching those who would not touch, healing those who others thought were beyond healing. Those holding this theological view can see medical and scientific technologies as created by God for us to use to relieve our suffering and the suffering of others. One Christian I interview talks about the way God supports and guides us toward medicine, saying, if you have a faith that's rooted in God and you come upon a health issue and you prayed about it and you ask for prayer collectively and God intervenes and heals you through medicine, That's the road you should go (laughs) because you prayed, you seek God's divine wisdom and intervention, and he has come in and he has used medicine to heal you. And you take the medicine in faith and you trust and believe God 
And that healing increases both your faith in medicine and your faith in God. It's not only physical ailments that religion, science, and medicine are compatible in responding to. Another man I interviewed who does pastoral work shared with us that the way he has seen the two work together to benefit mental health is really incredible. He says, our church has something we like to call celebrating recovery, where we celebrate victories in various ways in which people we are dealing with who maybe are addicted to various things or drug addictions, uh, drug addictions or other things that have led to mental health issues. There's things that can be done from the faith perspective, he says. There's prayers we can pray. And there's also ways in which God has given us science to understand the chemical imbalances, to understand the biological causes, to give us the medicines. And he says, I only see both faith and science going hand in hand. Finally, in some of our recent research, we found that faith and science can work together to alleviate suffering as we come to the end of this bodily life in this world. A man we interviewed spoke about the passing of his mother and the way he, see, he saw faith and science and God-given science really playing complementary roles at the end of her life. He said, I could see the amount of pain she was in. She didn't really have the strength to sit up or talk or stand. And when they finally used medicine to switch her over to alleviate that pain, she actually looked so calm. And I knew that was a gift God was giving us. The faith piece for me also was that she didn't actually fear her death. And we as a family were able to accept her death. And science and medicine was given to us by God to help her transition without pain. And that is my ultimate hope that we all will have no more pain in the end. I think I will end there. And I just want to thank you for your attention and say um, how very much I'm looking forward to the questions that you might have. Uh, and thanks so much. It's really just been a joy to speak with you. Thank you very much, Elaine. I really appreciate both the wisdom and also your willingness to share some of your own journeys along the way. Thank you, Janelle. We have one one question that asks about what we can do in order to teach humility mm. in churches, you know, that then expands into all a variety of spheres of life. How do, how do we nurture that in our congregations? Do you have any suggestions? I think that one thing we need to talk about is what's underlying a lack of humility sometimes. I think um, sometimes uh, bravado uh, is a mask for underlying fear. We, we think we need to act like we know everything because we're afraid that our faith will crumble if we don't. And actually, I find that teaching children from a very young age that God is so expansive and his community of people is so expansive. And I think um, organizations like this one make this point that there are people out there who've thought a lot about things. So even if you don't know the answer to something, you don't know, you don't have a sense that satisfies you yet. Um, there's always something new. God is um, infinitely imaginative, I guess I would say. And so is um, the community of people um, of faith and there will be answers out there at some point. And I think that's an important sense that we don't, we just don't have to be afraid and we don't have to know everything right now. Yeah. Do you have any strategies you've used in your interviews with people that help you get at that fear that might be underneath? Yeah. I liked the question. Um, probably someone used it on me when I was angry at one point. Um, I like the question, um, what's at stake for you here? Sometimes I think when um, people uh, have a lot of bravado about knowledge or they um, are angry at you because you have a different view than than um, they do, that uh, a point of humility for you as the listener is to just say, help me understand what's behind your strong feelings. Help me understand uh, what's really at stake for you here. I like in the book, Being Mortal, the, the, the author talks about 
asking the question, what is your greatest hope and what is your greatest fear? Yes, yes, that's, um, yes, that's terrific, Janelle, thank you. Yeah, to get into that, what's going on underneath. Yeah, there's somebody who says, I've just finished reading your book and wonder if you could speak to how scientific communities could also promote curiosity about faith and God. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, most scientific communities um, don't think it's their um, sort of business to promote faith in God, if that makes sense. And I, but I understand where that question is coming from. I get asked that question um, quite a bit. You know, why can't scientists have hum more humility about faith in God? I think that the kind of things and the kind of values that scientists ha science has in its best sense um, foster a kind of curiosity about things like faith and help scientists uh, try to just ponder um, when uh, sort of science ends, like what the limits of science are. So that's one kind of thing that I've thought about quite a bit. I also think there's a lot of onus on church communities and particular kinds of faith communities to be more open to science and scientific thinking. And that kind of relational openness can actually ease the sort of negativity that the scientific and faith community have um, sometimes had with one another in the past and in the present. And so it's it's interesting. We tend to think of this as mainly a knowledge struggle. So why don't scientists think a certain way? Why don't um, Christian communities uh, think a certain way? But often it's much more of a relational struggle. Um, and if they're the, just having a relationship between scientists and people of faith who aren't scientists um, actually goes a long way to getting people to consider different perspectives outside their own. Often in the United States, we talk about in families not talking about religion and things like that. Have as as you have done your research, have you seen differences in terms of that openness across cultures in terms of being able to ask questions about religion of my each other? My family is is very different than that. I, some of yeah. you on the call know this, but my um, husband's a particle physicist, and so all we talk about is religion and science. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> like we um we love to talk about religion and science. So I do think that um I know what you mean. There's these always these articles that go around um around the time of the holidays and yeah. like, we're gonna have family meals together. Don't bring up religion, don't bring up politics, you know, don't mention the war, um, kind of thinking. And maybe in these gatherings where we know um you know, we only see each other once a year. Maybe that's appropriate um, not to dive right in into the deepest matters of our heart uh, right away. But I think in our deeper relationships, um, these are matters that people hold very dear, that they orient their whole identities and lives around. And if we are in a deeper relationship with someone and we never talk about such uh, deeply important matters of identity, uh, how strong is the relationship? So I think there needs to be a lot more effort put into yeah. fostering ways of being in dialogue with one another. What I would call in some of my work, a kind of convicted dialogue. So we don't always need to even be open to changing our mind about something, right? Where yeah. we feel like we have figured out, but I do think we need to treat other folks um, always with a sense of humanity which is very much a part of our own tradition as Christians, um, since we believe that each human being, regardless of their political perspective or scientific perspective, uh, is created in the image of God. So we don't really have a leg to stand on if we treat others in with anything less than that yeah. understanding. Here's a question about many churches still have an understanding of calling such that it is only for pastors and missionaries. How do we encourage them to teach a broader view of calling where science can be encouraged as a gift? Hmm. Oh, I love that question. Um, I'm writing a book about that. <laughs> what Very else good. do academics do, right? You know, of the making of books, there's yeah. no end. So um, I'm actually writing a book right now with colleague Denise Daniels at Wheaton about um, faith in the workplace. But um 
I think it has to start really young. Um, some of my research I have uh, done uh, makes me want to do talks to youth pastors, if that makes yeah. sense, uh, because we have to um, start when people are young in our churches, making science um, interesting to them, yeah. especially if we have the privilege of having actual scientists in our congregations. Um, under those conditions, I want pastors and church leaders to reach out to those folks to allow them to give talks at church, to lead seminars about how they understand the integration of their scientific work and their faith. Um, if you're a scientist who is a Christian um, and you're at a church that's really blessed with having these folks like you part of it, um, why don't you reach out to another congregation that doesn't have scientists part of it? And so I think uh, just sharing more openly about how we see the intersection of our faith and our work really across any job, but we're talking specifically about the scientific yeah. career. I think that's incredibly important. Um, if you have an, an active laboratory, um, consider taking kids from your congregation in on a Saturday to kind of see what you're up to, um, to really show them, you know, visit science museums, talk to them. There are just tons of ways. There's some great organizations out there. There's, of course, BioLogos, um, the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion at the um, American Sciences, or the, um, <laughs> getting my acronyms mixed up yeah. here. Yeah. The American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, there is an organization called Science for the Church. And there's, of course, your wonderful ASA. So there, if you need a model, there are lots of places to find models. Very good. Here's a question. It's from your interviews. What would you say are the top three reasons that scientific faculty shy away from the Christian faith? So there's been a lot of report um, in the U.S., and I think these are good studies that show the increase in the non-religious. So there are fewer people who um, who attend religious organizations and take religion seriously in their lives. But still, Christianity is a hugely dominant religion in the U.S. It's actually very uncommon for um, people in the U.S. who are over 40 to have been raised um, in a home that didn't have some faith perspective. And most likely that was a Christian perspective. The number one reason people give for um, not considering uh, religion in, in general and the Christian faith in particular, scientists say that they had bad experiences with religion when they were children. Um, often that um, was a Christian church um, and a church which uh, did not allow them to ask um, questions of the face. So Jill, the scientist I talk about, that's a pseudonym, um, you know, she's very typical of what I heard. Scientists also, um, secondly, have um, concerns um, about theology. So this is interesting. They have, people think they have concerns mainly about science but they have actually concerns about the intellectual depth of the Christian faith. I think we often do not do ourselves any favors when we act like things aren't intellectually difficult. Um, and then the third kind of reason that scientists give often is, um, a, this is closely related to two, is um, reasons of theodicy or um, problems of pain in the world. Yeah. Um, and how does a good God allow such suffering? So um, please keep in mind that many scientists were drawn to science because they thought that science has the ability to alleviate suffering. And fourthly, um, there are definitely scientists who, as they learned more about science, um, actually thought that science displaced the Christian faith. But that actually is a reason that's inferior to the other reasons. And I think that's that's interesting to point out that most scientists in their own terms do not say that they lack religious faith because they're scientists or what they know okay. about science. It's usually for other kinds of reasons. Okay, very good. Here's another one. While science and faith are concerned for healing, they also have been used for destruction. Absolutely. So how can be, we be honest about this and still promote hope? Oh, I love that. You guys are so smart. If you were my <laughs> students, I'd give you A's. These are terrific questions. I'll try to be quicker. <laughs> it's really hard yeah. to know. These are like questions about which many books have been written, right? I'm trying to be faster. Um, I think we need to be honest about science and honest about faith. Um, 
both have been used at the wrong hands to bring about destruction in the world. So I've um, studied um, to some extent um, Black church communities and the ways in which there is a collective memory about um, medical mistrust because of the Tuskegee syphilis trials, um, because of the ways in which uh, racism was justified at the hands of science. So these um, issues are very complex, but I think at the end of the day, we need to be honest about what our communities have done that's really can be legitimately called evil and what kind of repair work needs to be done um, to try to address some of that. And have you applied this, the idea of this fine line between fear and anger to the issue of evolution and the conflict over that in the United States? We have. Um, most of what we do as a research team at, at Rice University um, uh, through our Religion and Public Life program and now the Banyak Institute is to um, try to describe the social reality. So I've spent a lot of time researching why people have problems with evolution, what they feel is at stake in um, yep. Christian communities for um, rejecting evolution. They feel that God and humankind is at stake. A lot is at stake. So they feel that um, evolution, the way it's presented, does not allow a role for God in the world. And I think sometimes scientists present evolution with larger ramifications than it has and go outside of their knowledge areas um, to inappropriately um, chastise religious communities. And when I speak to scientific communities about how they can get kids more interested in science and more interested in evolutionary biology, I encourage them to try hard to keep to the science and not to speak outside of their knowledge areas. Um, they said, it's not that you have to say good things about religion. I don't want you to be um, to lie to people if this is not your particular belief system, but just don't say horrifically bad things that are not yeah. true. And yeah. that um, I think will go, they're like, do you expect me to be a theologian? I'm like, no, just um, don't put people down. And that will go quite a long way towards um, increasing a thoughtful yeah. reflection on evolutionary theory. Well, you, you did quote C.S. Lewis in your talk. And so does what do you think his understanding of pride applies to certain Christian attitudes towards science? Hmm. Um, hopefully the the questioner is not a Lewis expert. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> and I'm gonna say that it also applies to um how scientists sometimes view Christians, quite frankly. So um, it's really been fun to work with people like um, your own Jennifer Weissman and Francis Collins. I haven't worked directly with Francis, but um, certainly um, know him and and want to amplify his work. Um, there's there's other folks just doing a tremendous work right now. Um, and I don't want to mention any more names for fear of missing someone. But there are folks out there who just are doing so much as scientists themselves to bridge um, faith and scientific communities. And some of my my earlier work, I called these folks boundary pioneers. They're folks which really have um, deep identities in Christian faith and deep identities um, in the scientific world and find themselves in a place where they're sometimes trusted by both communities. And and really are able to build as boundary pioneers really effective bridges between both communities. We need to remember that bridges some, get walked on sometimes. Yeah. And um, these folks also can face a lot of negativity from each community. And so um, if you have, if you're a religious leader, a pastor listening to this, um, and you have folks in your community who are scientists who are Christians, I would really encourage you to encourage them to use the full aspect of their different identities yeah as they relate to the world around them. That's really, that sort of um, speaks to this next question about the intersection of work and political identity and how many people on the right don't trust truth-seeking institutions because mm -hmm. they're largely populated by people on the political left. So how do we build trust across groups and can believing scientists like the members of the ASA help? What mm. might be their role? 
Oh, and the overlap between religion and politics that we're seeing um, so much now. These are such um, complicated issues. And I think we're going to need to listen a lot to each other. Um, sometimes when I'm in a group that with lots of people that I disagree with, I have made a little rule for myself where I wait for three other people to speak before I jump in. It's just a small thing for me. You make you make another rule that works for you, listeners. Um, that's just for me uh, because I don't have trouble speaking. Maybe if you're someone who's often a marginalized voice at the table, maybe you want to jump in and push yourself to be the first person to speak. And so I think that kind of listening and understanding um, what the different communities that we embody bring to the table in the most positive sense, I think is incredibly important. Um, holding our some of our views a little bit less tightly. So um, usually as Christians, we want our Christian identity to guide how we are in the world. And sometimes we have let other kinds of identities take a larger role in our lives than our Christian identity. And I think that's that's a really important thing to work on. I'm sure that I have in some ways. So we all fall prey to this very easily. And so um, especially when the communities that we're part of make those identities yeah. very important for belonging. And yeah. so it's really important to get in a space where you can freely reflect on how you're living in the world and, and whether or not you're living consistently with the way yeah. you want to be. Yeah, there's, there's curiosity here about the scientist you talked about named Jill. And have you stayed in touch? And I, and I mean, what are the impact of just your conversations and your questions on her? Oh, that's a great question. That's a really um, gently gentle kind of a question. Um, this is one of the things I really don't like about my work. So first, what I really like about my work is that there is enormous opportunity to meet all kinds of people around the world. So our team has studied scientists in eight different national contexts. It's been a huge privilege. And you get to listen to people's stories of conversion and deconversion. And that has a real impact on you and deepens, I think, your own understanding of the faith. But our role as researchers is not to change people's minds. It's not to um, help them in the way that um, you might if you're a pastor or a counselor. And I really dislike that. So sometimes people really um, change my heart and um, change how I am in the world. And I just take, I try to take that forward with me faithfully. Jill and knowing her in the two hours that I talked to her has really affected the way I see church, the way I see yeah. parenting my own child. And that I think is what in the largest sense I gave to her. But unfortunately, um, it wasn't my role to keep in touch yeah. with her in any sense. Yeah. yeah. So I have an it we're going to sort of flip flip the the emphasis is do you have any good examples of churches that through their ministry of scientists in the congregation have had hearts and minds that have transformed on a larger scale. Sort of what is the, the best example you have of where a church embraced science, was um, embraced curiosity, you know, nurtured their children in this mm -hmm. way? Any, any good examples of this? I think there are lots of good examples. The better person to ask that question to is my um, colleague and friend, Greg Kutsona, who with Drew Rick Miller mm -hmm. runs Science for the Church, because they work you know, with churches in trying to help them um, understand how they can use science um, yeah. in the integrity of their ministry. This feels like a shameless plug, but my church, um, St. Andrew's Presbyterian in Houston, Texas, has a science and faith series. We got um, one of the small grants at one point from Science for the Church. And we have a reading group on science and faith. And um, in the past, we've done youth ministry around science and mm -hmm. faith. So um, I just really, you know, love that the church and the pastoral team has been so very open to having myself and my husband and others who are scientists in the congregation come together around these issues. Um, I think it's going to take 
pastors recognizing how, that they have to some extent a responsibility to call out the scientists in their midst mm-hmm. and hold them to this standard. And especially for um, congregations that are not in areas of the country or in regions um, where there are a lot of scientists who attend yeah. to understand the importance of still integrating science into their work as a gift from God and its importance in raising children with a thoughtful approach to the faith. And often these churches have so many other issues that they are trying to deal with. This seems like the last yeah. thing. Yeah. And it's important for us to keep bringing it to the table, but also be thoughtful about how we do in communities that are particularly impoverished or that have less access to resources yeah. than some of us do. Yeah. Have you ever done research on the intersection of preaching and science as part of trying to get a sense of what's going on in the church? So um, an earlier study uh, was called the Religious Understandings of Science Study. And I wrote a book with my colleague, um, Chris Scheidel, um, called Religion Versus Science, What Religious People Really Think. And in that study, we looked at different communities and cities and congregations mm-hmm. and looked at um, church, like texts and um, sound files of sermons um, as a way of understanding things at the congregational level. Um, and it's the pastor has to feel that they are somewhat knowledgeable about science and have support from the congregation to bring it in. There are a lot of impediments yeah. to bringing science into preaching. Yeah. So how how best for a scientist in a secular setting to talk about their faith? Because often their colleagues mm-hmm. would say, we don't we don't talk about beliefs, we just talk about facts. Any suggestions on how to approach that? So I would encourage scientists who want to talk about their faith at work to leave the um, fact belief debate behind. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's almost always maladaptive for relationship building. Um, I would suggest that um, scientists be genuinely involved in a community of faith and just talk generally about that with their colleague friends as they would any other piece of their lives. So to the extent you can talk about your family and your children with their colleagues, then you could also talk about your um, participation in your congregation and, you know, what you do there that you're involved in a group and people find that um, kind of transparency generally, I think pretty disarming. Yeah. Um, It's just a, sort of, um, it's much more of a practice oriented approach. Like, yeah. let me tell you about the practices that I engage in my yeah. life. Um, cause I just want to know you as a person. And that then sometimes leads to deeper conversations. Yeah. It's being, I guess, authentic, mm-hmm. right? Truly who you are. Um, do you have any advice on, on the, the issue of how Christians attacked and demeaned medical experts during the pandemic and what might be done to address that. Ugh, that the, was so hard. That was so yeah, hard. The healing yeah. healing question, address it and heal those rifts. So very, very hard. I spent a lot of time um with my team doing outreach to faith communities and um, in particular um, outreach to um, communities that are predominantly black and Hispanic. And let me tell you, it was not the black and Hispanic communities that were having uh, medical mistrust issues. Um, It was much more likely to be um, white evangelicals that had concerns about trust in scientists and those folks who have not experienced the kind of reasons for mistrusting medicine that some others have. So it was a very complicated, highly politicized situation. And I and others tried very hard to get scientists who have faith commitments very involved in the mix. 
and reaching out and talking about vaccination so that people could hear um, the science from people that they trusted because of their faith. That's where I think scientists were people of faith became incredibly important. Um, and because of the use of technology, we were able to reach a lot more people than we might have been otherwise have lots of Zoom events. Um, I almost got burnt out from doing so much of that work. And I still think that you're right, that there is a riff um, that remains as a result of that. And we need, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about this. Um, it's very, very difficult and people's emotions run very, very high. And when we start mixing you know, faith and politics and science, um, it's a real recipe for disaster. So we need folks who are genuine, who will lead the way in much more reasonable, but also much more compassionate conversation. Yeah. And it speaks to those people on the boundaries between okay. faith and science, right? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And then one final question, which is about um, sort of the trends. Mm. Have you noticed a shift in attitudes from either religious people or the science community? What What is your sense of where things are moving at the present mm. time? More polarization or less? We are um, doing an international study of another international study of scientists right now, and I hope to do one of religious communities um, in the years to come. I do think that um, issues of technology and faith are replacing our classic debate over evolution, mm. and people are mm. much more worried right now um, about the impact of AI and rapid growth of AI on the workforce and the kind of inequities that that might lead to. Um, you know, I may be able to write more quickly or, or access knowledge more yeah. quickly as an academic. And so AI may be useful to me, but not so helpful to someone who works in a factory assembly line. So that's, you know, these, these are huge inequities that the church ought to care about. So I think ethics and AI is a big one. The other kind of thing that is just happening and we're worrying about is um, still the increase in human reproductive genetic technologies yeah. and what they say for issues of humanness. Um, my colleague, uh, John Evans at UCSD has written a really um, great book on this topic. So the technology science faith interface yeah. and um, coming to terms and just uh, with what our responsibilities as uh, Christians and the church writ large is to give an ethical framework um, for some of these, yeah. um, the many of the issues, even in our rapidly secularizing society, still a uh, historic Christian perspective on ethics yeah. and especially issues of humanness has become incredibly yeah. important. And I think it's a real opportunity for the church to help the society think through some of these issues. Very good. That's very, very helpful. We want to thank you so much for your talk and for the many thoughtful responses to these questions that I'm sure that will continue to go into the next sessions. Oh, gosh. So thank you so much um, for all the colleagues at the ASA and um, bless you and really appreciate this time with you. It's been an honor. We'll turn it back over to Vicki. Thank you, Elaine, so much. Uh, such timely words of wisdom and encouragement. And you certainly have a winsome way about you and you've given us uh, much food for thought. And we're just very grateful for your uh, leadership modeling these virtues with grace and humility. As we move to our closing time together, we're honored to have Sierra Reyes Tan with us in the audience today. She is joining us from Nashville. Sierra is a biologist, science writer, and editor who is passionate about science communication to faith communities. She has a PhD in cell and molecular biology from the University of Michigan. She has served as managing editor for the ASA's God in Nature magazine and currently works as digital content editor for BioLogos, uh, a partner organization of the ASA. And she teaches at 
Lipscomb University. And most importantly, she just became a mom for the second time with the birth of her son last month. She's going to share a recording of This Is My Father's World now. So take it away, Sierra. I'd like to invite you to a time of worship. I'm going to be singing This Is My Father's World. Feel free to sing along or reflect on the lyrics. This is my father's world And to my listening ears All nature sings and round me rings The music of the spheres And this is my father's world I rest be And the wonders wrought This is my father's world The birds their carols raise The morning light the lily white Declare their maker's praise Is my father's world he shines in all that's fair in the rustling grass I hear him pass he speaks to me everywhere this is my father's world oh let me ne'er for the wrong seems off so strong God is the ruler yet and this is my father's world why should my heart be sad the Lord is king let the heavens ring God reigns let the God reigns, let the earth be glad. God reigns, let the earth be glad. Wasn't that beautiful? I first became aware of Sierra's musical talent when she performed with Francis Collins at the ASA 2018 annual meeting when they rocked the house at Gordon College. She also performed at the conclusion of our winter symposium last year. So thank you, Sierra, and congratulations on the new addition to your family. Before we close in prayer and as we move into facilitated discussion groups, I'm gonna provide some final comments and instruction. First, if you are not an ASA member, we'd be delighted to welcome you into our community. All the details and benefits of membership can be found on our website at the link displayed in the chat box now. Student and early career memberships are complimentary, so please spread that deal to students in your spheres. Secondly, we've been able to offer this symposium free of charge in large measure due to the generous support of our sponsors and donors. And thank you to the many who included a donation as part of your registration. It's not too late to make a gift and we'd welcome your prayerful consideration of support to help us cover the costs. To do so, simply go to the ASA website, click on the link in the chat or use Venmo to donate now. Elaine has graciously donated her honorarium in the form of the complimentary book, Why Science and Faith Need Each Other, that many of you received. And if you didn't get a copy or want to purchase any of her other books, we encourage you to do so through the ASA Virtual Bookstore, which is powered through Christian Book. 
And for those not participating in watch parties, I want to extend a warm welcome to join us for the follow-on Zoom discussion, which Janelle and I will be facilitating. It's a great way to meet new friends from around the world. As we close our time together today, I invite you to join us in prayer. O oh, most holy and righteous God, you are the magnificent creator of the universe, ruler of the cosmos, giver of every good and perfect gift. Our father of all comfort and compassion who gave his only son so that we might have eternal life. You have been our dwelling place, Lord, through all the generations, and we are deeply grateful for you this day and every day. And as we place our faith in you and you alone, you are we are trusting you, using both the joys and challenges of our lives for your transformative purposes. Father God, you are all-powerful, and you are all-loving, and you hear our prayers. So this day, for your many servants around the globe, living in a divisive and divided culture, we pray for healing of the sick, as you are the great physician, for comfort and peace for those mourning the loss of loved ones, for the struggling, those struggling with emotional and psychological issues, for strength and endurance for medical professionals working on the front lines of our healthcare system, for the oppressed and marginalized, give us hearts of care and compassion for the most vulnerable. For our polarized world, give wisdom and discernment to leaders around the globe, both nationally and in our communities, such as pastors, professors and teachers, scientists working in research and academia, government officials, leaders of faith-based organizations, and so on. And for all of us, that we may move from fear to understanding in all aspects of our lives, give us ears to listen and learn from one another, eyes to see beyond ourselves, postures of humility and curiosity, and hearts to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please continue to bless Elaine and Sierra and their respective organizations as they seek to show how science and Christianity intersect in constructive, even beautiful ways. We ask you to lift them up and give them effectiveness and wisdom and their influence for common good and efforts in integrating religion and science. Continue to draw people to yourself using them as your vessels. You are our refuge and strength, our trustworthy companion, and ever-present help in our trouble. Our hope and faith are found in you and you alone. And while we celebrate the gift of scientific insight and wisdom, equip us to be the United Church around the world, showing compassion for and love for our neighbors. And Lord, we long for the day when all tears will be wiped away and we meet you face to face. Until then, we humbly ask you to hear our prayers. So go with us now in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Elaine and Sierra, again, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you who have joined us today. If you are coming to the Zoom discussion, click on the chat link now, and we'll, we'll see you there in about five minutes. So goodbye, everyone, and, and God bless.